and you inhale the ease of intuition. The wisdom that allows breasts to remain in sync with the rhythm of life. From the heart, the chest, and move up to the shoulders. The shoulders, often the space where we metaphorically are asked to take on the yoke of living. the burdens of the body, the burdens of society, the burdens of this world. And in a time where life is so full of uncertainty, burdens of not knowing, those burdens that almost seem too much to bear. In this moment, while they are absolutely real in other moments, while we can contemplate them all day long and the next moment, in this moment, we exhale and allow them to leave. We allow this body, this mind in this moment to be free. There will be more than enough moments to come back to those, but in this moment, as we are showing deep kindness to our experience, radical love to our bodies, wholehearted, 
caring attention to our heart minds. In this moment, we exhale those burdens. Maybe even on the next exhale, we roll the shoulders back and down just a little bit. In doing so, maybe the body sits a little more upright. Maybe the act of letting go of those burdens naturally allows us to step into the sitting position with a certain regalness. Exhale the burdens and inhale ease. And as we move up to the head, neck, the jaw, the face, the eyes, the forehead, the back of the head, the top of the head, the whole head. You know that the face is often called upon to present it's our principal way of engaging the world around us. And sometimes it's asked to perform, you know, to present as though things internally are not what they are. You're asked to put on a smile and just keep it moving. as we sit here assembled with many other individuals just like you that care, that have fears, that have joys, that are often asked to present. 
and recognize that we are connected at the heart with eyes closed. No one can see, there's no need to present. We are as we are and we exhale any need for things to be different. And just like the pelvis, we inhale acceptance. A deep acceptance of ourselves. Now the whole body is made alive with breath. From the top of our heads down to the soles of our feet. From the soles of our feet back to the tops of the head. As we've exhaled anything that would take us away from kindness, now we're just in a cycle of inhaling and exhaling kindness, beauty, love, ease. This homecoming into the body, this throbbing, this aliveness, this resting in our true nature. As we begin to wrap up our time here, maybe placing a hand over the heart, maybe two hands over the heart. Just feeling the light beneath the palm. Is it possible for this next breath to be received with any more kindness? Is it possible to be any softer, any gentler, any more loving? to ourselves, our experiences, is it possible? Allowing this sweetness mm. to 
allowing this gentleness, allowing this kindness, allowing this honey dipped goodness to pervade the whole body and to carry us over the next few minutes as we begin to come out of meditation and enjoy our bodies, our experiences, each other and our community can it be done from this space homecoming this space of connection this space of embodiment Deep breath in through the nose, collect the attention once again. A soft exhale and release. Another deep breath in through the nose, whole body made alive with the soft lion's roar, mouth wide open, we exhale, release. Final breath in through the nose. Final breath out like a giant cat. And then slowly, softly, sweetly, in your own time, begin to open your eyes, come back into the space. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Thumbs up, you can hear me okay? Great, great, great. Hi, Shelly. <laughs> um, so i like to um, take a moment right now after those sits, just to like stand, move, wiggle the body because um, yeah, just to bring, bring life back into the body. So you can do whatever you want. Take all the 60 seconds just to get it moving. I literally, I literally just said to myself, oh, that was good. <laughs> so let's all take a moment. Yeah, that was honestly like, it was good to like even digitally just to be able to, um, you know, like feel everyone and feel connected. Um, yeah, I needed that. 
I've been running around hustling and bustling, so it feels really good. Maybe um maybe we'll go back to the chat over here and just have a couple more where anybody can um if everybody can just check in a couple words with how they're doing in this moment after I sit. I am at the loose, loose, loose. And um yeah, I'm happy and loose. I'm grateful. Nice. So Jean, happy. Shelly, relaxed. Patrice, refreshed. Safia, relieved. Me, I'm happy. Oh, that's me. Um, Chris, hopeful. <laughs> Anna, happy to see you. Anna, happy to see you. <laughs> Jenny's calm. Chelsea, connected, open, tender. Good, Kathy, calmer than before. Doug's present. Charlie is loose and kind. Good. Kyle, hi Kyle. Um, smiling. Safia forgiving. Mm. Jessica in my body and grateful. I like it. Vicky, lovely embodiment. Needed this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. Um, Dan, grateful, refreshed, calmer, looser. Good. Donna, filled with loving kindness. Good. All right, we're done. Bye. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just kidding. Nancy, restless. Yeah, sometimes that comes up with sits too. Yeah, that's real. Thanks for speaking to that. Um, let me turn the light on. Okay. okay. Nice. Get all settled in. Gotta look official now. Got glasses, I'm official. All right. So, <clears throat> you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to do the, that sit that way is because you know, we all um, have experienced tension at different times in our lives, but I think that there's no mistaking it's uh, that we are as a society as a society in a rather acute moment of tension and um, on a number of different levels right? the issues around our gender politics racial politics the election that's coming and there's a pandemic like all of these, things complicating one on top of the other, it really is rather, rather easy and natural to experience constriction and tightness and closing down uh, both of uh, the heart and the body. Because so much of life around us is experiencing that. Quite literally, as a society, we are locked down well, some places a little bit more movement than other places, but we don't have the freedom of movement that we, that we had a year ago. We can't do all the same things. And I've just been finding for myself that that type of locked down experience is, uh, is being reflected in my heart as well as my external experience. Like I can see how this heart has become a little less open, how this heart has become a little more in survival mode. Just get through, just, 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 just try to survive. And also I like, um, I always say like, I grew up in a black church. So if anybody, if any, I, anybody says something that, that resonates with you, you can just raise your hand. Um, I promise I won't call on you, but at least it just lets, lets the speaker know that somebody is feeling them. Anybody feel constricted at all in their heart? Well, uh. <laughs> um, and so I've just been really interested as of late in ways to create space in the heart, in the body, in the life. Like, how can I... Um, like how can one have compassion in the midst of crisis? How can we, when everything is swirling, everything is going crazy, 
uh, find some respite, some release, some, some freeing of the heart. So this has been my investigation as of late. It is um, really, uh, yeah, it's really good to be able to come and share some of, some of my thoughts, uh, some of my learnings, uh, my practice right now. So, compassion in the midst of crisis. I think that one of the challenges that occurs when we are in the mix, midst of crisis is like we talked about this closing down, this, um, this constriction. And I actually don't believe that the constriction is in and of itself a bad thing. The constriction, that closing down, in many ways, you know, we've all heard of fight, flight, freeze, um, and like the sympathetic nervous system response that happens when we get afraid of things. Now, sometimes that can get a bad rap. Sometimes it's like, oh, you know, why is, you know, I would just always like to have my heart open and, and kissing butterflies and everything to be okay. And sometimes life presents us with situations like very acutely in moments where like having the physiologic response of fight, flight, or freeze is an adaptive and beneficial process. Bus is coming down the road, not the time to stop and smell the flowers. You need to get up and get out the way. You need blood moving from the internal organs to the large muscles and getting up and getting out the way. As we know, one of the challenges with that is that in our modern world, we get in a cycle where that just continues. And so we think that we're constantly running from a bus or constantly hiding from a saber toothed tiger. And that type of fear fills the body. That type of, that type of constriction uh, plays in the mind. And with that fear in the body and the mind, one of the things that it does is that it can make us very myopic. It can make us, it can physically, it can close down the vision so that the, the, the pupils get pinpoint and close down what we're seeing so that, because all, so that all of our energies are focused on this one thing of survival. Again, in a moment, important and necessary. To live life like that, harming and uh, not beneficial for long-term growth and wellness. So that understanding, what you know, has been in my head, I've known this to be the case. And one of the things that has got me for a while uh, in my practice lately is like, if I know this to be the case, why when the heart is pressed, why do I still get on that same cycle? and do that same thing? And why can't I just like think my way out of it? Why can't I just like know it enough to not do it anymore? And because of that, thanks Chelsea, because of that, I, I, I've been like, the, the, one of the ways, one of the, one of the, the expressions of freedom, the gateways of freedom is not just through thinking, but it's through the embodied experience of freedom. It's through, thanks Jane, it's through having the body know what it's like to not be constricted or contracted. Now, that can happen spontaneously at different times when we're in a moment of enjoying great time with uh, a child or a loved one or eating a great meal, that, that can happen spontaneously. And it can also happen through intentional cultivation. And so the intentional cultivation of the heart and mind, the intentional cultivation of, of, of moments where we can have greater ease in our lives allows for the body to, to come back to, uh, come back to a, a baseline level where there's more freedom and openness, where there is less constriction. And from that space of freedom and openness, we can then move out into the world and not be, uh, not be so tight, not be so held down, not be so 
uh, so, so charged by each thing in the world that, that pricks us. One of the things that I've also been noticing in my practice is that there are a lot of things that really annoy me right now. Just a lot of things in life. Like, I'm like, why is this like that? And why is he like that? And why are they doing it? Like, <laughs> I get, there are a, there's a couple day period, like in this past week where I was just like, angry at baseline. I was just like, you know, there's this, I, I, I take a lot of pride of kind of like being okay, easy going and relatively happy, but I know it's not a great day when I wake up and my, <laughs> and the first word that comes to my mind is, damn it. <laughs> like that really happened. And, and at some point later in the day, I had to start laughing about it because I was like, wait, why, what were you upset about? And, 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 and I noticed how at times the mind started looking for reasons to be upset. Like the body was just constricted. The body just contracted. There were things that like I, there was the piling on of stuff in my life. Work is intense. Family is intense. The world is intense. And it's piling, piling, piling on. And you know, it was a period where my practice was very much like, like only like pulling out weeds. Like I would do it, like uh, check it off the list. I would do it, but it was it was doing it to like check off a box or doing it to like get over a quick problem. But it wasn't doing it with the perspective like this is what I do uh, because. Uh, this is just like the, the way I move through life, life at baseline. And I recognize that just like I floss every day, like this is part of my, my wellness practice is what I do. And so I had kind of this, um, this whack-a-mole attitude about things like, oh, I'm really upset about this. Okay, let me, let me, let me sit for a couple minutes or let me like go do, the, do some other practice. But it wasn't, I had gotten away from really leaning on my daily practice as the baseline foundation for my day, for my life. And when I've gotten away from that, I noticed a couple of weeks ago happened that my heart was just more tense, more tight. And from that tension, from that tightness, like everything that happened just reinforced that tension and that tightness. So there was no, there was, and so the access to like the wisdom in the body wasn't there because the body was, was clenched and then everything kept triggering that same, cl that same clench perspective. Recently I had an experience with um, a, so I just moved to California to start my residency in family medicine. Um, yay. And I'm at UCLA and loving it and it's great. It's warm um, and sorry. Um, and um, yeah, so I had this experience recently where I was um, going into, walking to the building and my, there was this, um, there was a lady, so you have that mask on walking to the building. There was a lady walking, uh, walking out of the building and as I'm walking in, I step, I'm walking to the booth where you grab the security booth in the front where you grab a mask. I'm gra I grab the mask, I'm putting it on, this lady's walking in and she comes in behind me and as I'm putting the mask on, she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, man, I'm putting a mask on. And she's like, well, it's like, you can't be in the building without a mask on. I'm like, all right. Well, again, this is like five steps into the building and security desk where I'm putting a mask on. And over the next, of course, the next like two, three minutes, like we have this very tense interaction where she is like berating me for not having a mask on. And, you know, she's pointing her finger in my face and she's and ultimately it ends with her saying you outside now. And um, I was like, uh, OK, um, I was very respectful of the thing. I was like, all right, yes, ma'am, no problem. Grab my mask and turn around and walk out the building. And then, you know, I made sure to get her name and um, her information just because, uh, yeah. So later I sent an email to, you know, it works its way up the chain. And um, it comes back like, um, and it, I later have a, a couple conversations around it. And now everything is, um, it, it's starting to smooth out. In that moment when that was going on, like I was so uh, 
understandably frustrated, um, indignant, um, just like it, it called back so many issues of just being spoken to, talked to, disregarded in ways where it would, it's like you don't exist, like you don't, you, you are less than a person. And the fact that this was a white lady and I'm a black man, it just, uh, it, it, it pressed all of the societal buttons that are up right now. Um, and this person was an administrator at the hospital and that complicated it as well because she was like, when I asked her for her name, she's like, oh, I'm an administrator. And she didn't want to give me her name. Ultimately, I found out who it was. And like all I could see for that day, um, and you know, it was how much, how, how, how screwed up our society is. And it's like on that day, all of the bad ills of society, it's like they, people were, they just kept becoming more and more uh, pr uh, present for me. I, I kept hearing about this problem and this problem and this problem. And it was like my brain was tuned into that, that, that channel. And, you know, my stomach got super tight throughout the day and my heart got super tight throughout the day. Like I physically was responding to the tension in my world and in my body um, it, because it was, uh, because of the situation, I physically was responding in a way that was creating more tension. And it's understandable, like I was stressed and uh, it wasn't a bad or improper response anyway. Like it was just the somatic experience of what tension is like in the body. So fast forward a week later, I have a conversation with um, um, the CMO of the hospital about it all. And um, he is, um, he's just, he's really good at helping like to like think big picture and to ground. Uh, he's a he's, he's a meditator as well, just a really wise older dude, and we're having a great conversation. And one of the things that um, I was coming from this conversation is like each time I talked about it, each time I relive this experience, like my my chest, my 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 heart, my throat would get really clenched. And from that space of being really clenched, like I couldn't, like I would relive the situation again. I couldn't like moved past anything because I was just like tight, I was clenched. Um, and then being able to like talk through the situation and basically allow my body to like move through what it needed to move through, I, I was able to have more, more access to like, oh, I don't have to be like, um, I don't have to, I don't have to experience it like this. You know, up until that point prior, you know, when I thought about what I wanted to have from this situation, it was like, oh, well, obviously she behaved like this. She needs to be run out of town and I need her badge. And I need every, I need, we need to talk to the sheriff. We need to talk to the, to the FBI. We need to get like, like, I wanted to nail her to the wall for this behavior, the CIA on this. Um, and and one of the things that was interesting once I was able to have a little more physical space from it was that I was, I was able to more clearly see what I needed for healing in that, in the, in that space, in, in that, uh, in that interaction. And what I mean is, so the administrator who came back and had other conversation with Dr. Harrington, he was like, well, when also all this was said and done, he's like, well, what do you want to be done with this? Like, we can run this up the chain as high as you want. Like, what do you want to be done? Because the hospital is, is understandably very sensitive right now to issues around race. Um, and, and just fast forward to uh, additionally, around that same time, uh, we had had a shooting in the hospital by a police officer um who shot one of the patients who was having a psychiatric break so the hospital is sensitive to this right now um this happens with this um with this with this, admi this other administrator and so dr herring is like what do you want to happen and like i said i wanted her to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of hospital policy but then after a couple of days we had the conversation and the heart releases 
And um, and I, I talking to Dr. Herring about it more, like he he had obviously talked to this Julie was her name. He talked to her and he was like, in that moment, actually, she was going outside to meet with some of the hospital, uh, with some of the county regulators. And I did see her after our interaction go out to go meet with some people. Um, she was in the, the job of those regulators is that they're there standing and t taking toll, like how many, the compliance of mask wearing and glove wearing and how we do PPE in the hospital. So they were going to go around on a tour of the hospital and see about PPE compliance. So in that so in that moment, right, she's like her boss's boss is like, is observing her on, sorry, I live in Los Angeles right now, so there's a horn. Her boss's boss is observing um, her on like this thing that she's responsible for, PPE. And she sees somebody walking to the hospital without, you know, with what she thought was without the mask on at the time. And like her, she's, she's up about it, she's upset, whatever. Now, that doesn't in any way excuse the way she talked to me. It doesn't excuse her, it doesn't excuse her. Like, I don't take that part on. When my heart was released and when there was more grounding, what did happen is that I was able to see these things from her perspective. And when I was asked, like, what do I want? Simp for me, simply bring it to the attention of, you know, a couple of administrators and, you know, they circled back around to her she had she emailed me we're gonna have lunch next week she's like you know super, she was she was on it she recognized what she had done she was apologetic it was cool <clears throat> the point i'm making with this is that with compassion like when i was able to be compassionate to myself i was able to be to have a bigger picture perspective on what was going on for her now one of the problems one of the problems with the story that this story might illustrate is that I don't want to, for a second, make it sound like everything was hunky dory. We hugged and it was kumbaya because sometimes like stuff gets messy and that's important and that's necessary. The mess is necessary. The protest, the whatever it may be, the speaking truth to power is necessary. And what I'm, what um, this story illustrated for me is like, I was able to see, to see the difference be between like, what was necessary and needed in that moment or that situation versus what was coming purely from my own contracted state. Because I think that being able to talk to her and address the issue, you know, it's on the radar of a couple of um, administrators as well. And, you know, everyone is like aware this is an issue. Like we don't have to like write her up and, you know, get a demerit on her professional right, whatever. Sometimes that's necessary to go to that level. And, and I think that it's important to do that at times. But coming back to a grounded space in, in the heart mind allowed me to see, uh, allows for more clarity to assess and address when that is necessary versus when just the conversation is necessary versus when some other behavior is necessary. And so the, what I'm saying is like really grounding the heart, grounding the body, grounding this oneself allows for wisdom. You know, we often think of com uh, compassion and um, and the wisdom practices as two different things. And all the way it's taught traditionally is that they're, they're two wings of the same of the same thing, two sides of the same coin. It's from wisdom, um, we recognize that life, that we need compassion. And well, when we look at our lives uh, with, with great compassion, we can see where uh, when the heart is grounded with compassion, we can see how what wise action is needed in any moment. And so as, as we think about, talk about, experience um, so much challenge, chaos, confusion in our world at this point, politically, you know, socially, like on so many different levels, people often come to me and ask like, what is like the right action in this moment? What is it? And my first response is, what does your wise and grounded heart mind say is wise action in this moment? Like when you're able to ground yourself, like what, what does your own wisdom say is the wisest thing? And why that's important is because there is no prescription for compassionate action. I think sometimes we like to think that as a compassionate 
wise person, I should behave like this in this situation. As a compassionate wise person, I should behave like that in this situation. Eh, scratch that. As a compassionate wise person, our work is to ground the heart mind. And then when the heart mind is grounded and it meets a situation that calls for whatever, whether it meets the sadness of someone else, then compassion is the natural rising of that. When it when the, when a grounded and heart when a grounded heart mind meets the joy of someone else, then mudita or sympathetic joy is the expression of that. And we know all of the different uh, Brahma Viharas and the heart practices. They are described as the the expression of the experience of a grounded heart mind to the meeting of whatever, the joy of another, the sadness of another, like. And so our work is, is grounding, connecting. Our work is doing this right here. Our work is coming on a Friday evening to hop on Zoom with uh, a bunch of community members so that we can connect. Because when we leave the safety of this space, then life happens again. And Julie is there and our election is there and the pandemic is there. And without this time right here, what we can end up doing is, is spending a lot of unfruitful time out there and creating more tension for ourselves and for others around us. The second point I wanna make as we uh, move towards our close is that we touched on before is between addressing specific issues that come up one by one or addressing the fundamental constitutional nature of how we move through life, I have found it most beneficial to have a, con a practice that really on a regular basis allows me to ground to connect to feel embodied so that I can go deal with those other issues instead of uh, again that whack-a-mole perspective. Uh, Bruce Lee said um, under duress we do not rise to the level of our expectations but we fall to the level of our training. Under duress when the heart is pressed when the heart is stressed out you know, we have all these ideas of how we're going to respond, of what we're going to do. Well, if I was in the coffee shop and that white dude told that black dude he couldn't sit there like this, then I would have said X, Y, or Z. If I was on the street and that man said to that woman X, Y, or Z, I would have said this to stand up for her. Those are great ideas and thoughts. And when the heart is stressed and the body is stressed, we respond reflexively to the situation based on how what we've cultivated. So part of getting out of that is spending time cultivating a mind that is that is not so easily stressed and pressed. So we have more capacity for longer periods of time in those challenging situations. And then part of it is cultivating that, that reflex of responding with wisdom. So that when, so that when, when, the, when, when life does stress us, when things do stress us, we respond with greater wisdom. Um, we have access to a wiser part of ourselves. So I'm laughing because right now I am on obstetric service. And so I am uh, helping to, I work the overnight shift right now and I am helping to deliver babies. Um, and it is awesome. Like, <laughs> so now it's really cool because um, 
you know, just I don't know, the process of helping to usher in human life. It's, it's amazing. Um, now it's really cool because, you know, I'm able to, um, I, after several deliveries, like I have a much better sense of how to help nap, help a woman navigate through certain periods in the labor process, whether it's late in labor, active labor, whatever, whatever, as the baby's crowning, like I can, I can do that part now. Um, but, you know, for the first like couple of weeks of this rotation, that, that wasn't the case. And um, to be honest, I would get, I would get really nervous and scared when I walked into a delivery room and mom is screaming, dad is in the corner going like this. The medical staff is like calling for different meds and da 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 da. And I'm like the brand new baby doctor. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, and then the nurse it totally was the time, like my attending doctor is, um, supervising attending doctor is like on the other side of the hospital coming. And like the nurses are there and like, I'm the first doctor to make it there. And so they're asking me like, what has to happen? <laughs> I almost wet myself. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that was, it was so embarrassing because like, I didn't, I mean, I didn't know what to do. Right. I mean, I've only been doing this rotation, like whatever, a couple of days. Um, one of the things that I've been able to do now is still, when I walk into a room with a laboring mother, like the energy of the room is up. Everyone's still hustling and busting this or that. And by stepping into that energy, like our bodies quite easily can sympathetically uh, resonate with whoever we're around. So you step into that energy, your body starts to resonate at that level, all right? And so what I've started to train myself to do is as I, as I approach the door, I know room 703 is, uh, the, the mom in 703 is laboring. As I approach the door, I take a deep breath, feel my toes, come back up to my head, and then step into the room. And that simple moment of pausing allows for, um, allows for me to feel more connected and have more wisdom as to uh, what, what needs to happen in the moment. Yeah. So doing my best to train the reflex to create space, doing my best to train the heart mind to create uh, room for wisdom to be present. I just looked at the time, so I wanna, I wanna pause this right there. Because y'all know I could talk all day. I could, and it reminds me of another thing. <laughs> I won't go into my next seven points. I'll just pause this right there and um, open us up for some time of sharing questions, comments, and maybe, um, you know, if you wanna unmute yourself, get your voices into the room, speak whatever you'd like to speak in and not everybody has to go, just a couple minutes. Um, and if you'd also, if you wanna put it in the chat, feel free to do that, whatever you'd like. The floor is open. That's Jessica, humor creates nice room, absolutely. Uh, it really does, and we talked about fight, flight, freeze, and how one of the things that can shift us from our sympathetic nervous system, fight, fight, freeze, to our parasympathetic nervous system uh, is laughter. Um, it does it in a number of ways, but people have heard about like the vagus nerve, that laughter engages the diaphragm, that diaphragm, is connected to the parasympathetic nervous system um, and through the phrenic nerve. And when that happens, it's like, it's also deep breathing does that. Um, that moves us from fight, flight, freeze to tend and befriend or rest and digest. So thank you, Jessica and Jenny. Yes, important here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Shelly, any, anything you want to chime in with before you, announcements or anything before you wrap up? Yeah, just one, Femi. Thank you for being with your Minnesota family, mm -hmm. making the time. It's really such a gift that you're willing to do this. 
absolutely. And offer your big heart. I mean, and your congruence and the way you articulate the teachings with your big heart and the way you, you teach with your whole body, you know, just really um, reminds us how important it is to be embodied. So, yeah, thank you. And just a quick announcement to everybody, you know, Common Ground operates on this practice of generosity all the time. And Femi takes the, you know, the hour and a half he has extra out of his week <laughs> to be here with us. And so if you want to support Femi and his livelihood and, um, you know, I've known Fem Femi a long time and I can just the way he talked about like how awesome it is to help deliver babies is the way he talks about medicine and um, healing so if you want to help support that um, labor of love and uh, expression of goodness in the world, then you can go to Common Ground's website and make a donation and Femi will get two thirds of that for tonight. And uh, we'll send it to him with a lot of love on your behalf. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Shelly, Stacy, the whole Common Ground board. Thank you all for making the time. Like I said, other things we could be doing, like we could be playing video games, but we're not. <laughs> nah, we're cultivating community, cultivating the heart mind. And we, we hear a lot about the things that we don't do right in the world. So it's good to pause and say, appreciate something like this where we're actively making the world a more beautiful, loving place. So as we close our time out here, Maybe put a hand on that heart, maybe prayer mudra, however you want to close this evening. Take a final couple breaths in, fill the whole body up, all of the love, all of the tenderness of this moment, of this community. We breathe it in and fill the whole body. If there's any goodness, any beauty, anything of virtue or value that has come from our time here today together, may that merit go to alleviating the pain and suffering in the world at large. May it provide for protection and blessing and may it guide this nation over the next several days and especially on Tuesday. And may we be the change that we seek in this world. Ashe. <laughs> Bye-bye, my friends. <laughs>